Professor Jack C. Richards is the author of the best-selling English conversation book, Interchange. His book, Interchange, is an essential English learning material in the United States, New Zealand, Canada, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Over the years, Professor Jack C. Richards has been speaking in academic seminars in numerous countries around the world. This December, he is expected to receive an honorary doctorate from Victoria University for his contributions to English education and arts. On today's Heart to Heart, we have invited Professor Jack C. Richards, the man who created a new paradigm of English education. Hello and welcome to Heart to Heart. I'm your host, Yi So Jung. It's been more than a few decades since English uh, became the universal language. Today on the show, we have invited the author of uh, Interchange series, which is one of the most popular English course books. Please welcome Professor Jack C. Richards. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Nice How to be here. How are you? Uh, Hi, thank, thank you very you. much for your time today. Uh, this is your fifth visit to Korea, I guess? Uh, much more than fifth, because mm. I first came here in 1972, probably mm. my 25th. Wow, before I was born. Uh, probably, yes. Wow. Well before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> well, a few months before, actually. Um, what brought you to Korea this time around? This time I'm here to speak at conferences and so uh, mm -hmm. my publishers have uh, arranged a number of events for me and I've been talking to teachers and doing presentations in Busan and in Seoul. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about your book uh, first, Interchange series. How did you come up with, uh, how did you, how, why did you think that you need to write a book about English learning books? Um, I, I wrote that at the request of Cambridge University Press when I was based at the University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they were looking to expand into the American English market. Cambridge University is a British university and their books are traditionally in British English for the European market and mm -hmm. they opened a branch in uh, New York and they needed to uh, have a course book series in American English for mm -hmm. the world, those parts of the world that want to study American English like Korea. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, I, they asked me to, to write the series and that's how it came about. Mm -hmm. Then, before that offer came to you, uh, did you, why did you get involved in um, doing something for foreign students who want to learn English? Right, well that's my uh, professional field. So mm -hmm. when I was a student, I specialized in English language teaching, mm -hmm. did my PhD in that area in Canada, in mm -hmm. French Canada. Mm -hmm. And then I worked in Asia, in Indonesia, Singapore, Hong Kong. So I've uh, had a fairly active involvement in language teaching, training teachers, and also uh, writing books for teachers as well as for students. So. Mm. Um, that was just a natural extension of my interests. Hmm. You've been back and forth to Korea for the last uh, almost 40 years. I guess now, so. when you first came here in 1972, did you get to? Do you remember when you talked to Korean folks then? And did you did you think that Korean can't couldn't speak English? But now, how? Yeah, well, of are course, there, of course, there's a lot more interest now in learning English because of the role of English as an international language, mm -hmm. business travel, the internet popular culture and so on. So then it was not such an, a big thing as it is now. But of course, over the last 30 years, the Korean government, uh, the Minister of Education, has been doing a lot to uh, promote the learning of English to help uh, you know, maintain Korea's place as, a, as an international um, country, as an international uh, business center and so mm -hmm. on. So, and also for higher education. So mm -hmm. there has been a, a, a real push uh, and increasingly so, mm -hmm. I think, to improve the learning of English among Korean students. Mm. In the introduction of our interview, I said uh, English had become the international language uh, for for more than a few decades now. Right. But prior to that, French used to be an English, uh, French used to be an international language. Why it, do you think there had yes. been a shift? I, well, of course, French was, was commonly used as a sort of language of diplomacy in the 19th mm -hmm. century. But, of course, English has is, 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 uh, established itself for many reasons. One, of course, is the leg legacy of colonialism, British mm -hmm. colonialism. Mm -hmm. All of those countries that used to be part of the British Commonwealth, India, Singapore, Philipp uh, not Philippines, India, and so on, all inherited English. Um, and then, of course, after the war, as American influence spread, it became the language of American trade, American mm -hmm. uh, commerce and industry worldwide. In the last few years, it's become the world's second language because it uh, provides an opportunity for Koreans to speak to Japanese, to Mexicans, and so on. Mm -hmm. So all around, and, and within Europe itself, it's a common language for young people to use uh, in Europe. So mm -hmm. 
uh, it's there now and not much you can do about it except you have to follow the trend. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is a temporary thing though? Within, uh, I don't know, 50 to 100 years, should we expect to see another language being the international language? I don't see any indication of that because uh, English has penetrated in so many different things now. It's the, the most common language used for science and mm -hmm. for all sorts of um, publications, mm -hmm. uh, plus the internet, the media, mm -hmm. uh, higher education mm -hmm. and so on. And also just as a link language, as a language of common communication among mm -hmm. people in different parts of the world. So I don't see any other language that, that is sort of waiting to take over in mm. that particular role. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm trying to promote English. I, mm -hmm. I really doesn't bother me if it did disappear. Mm -hmm. But it just seems to be there for those mm. particular reasons. Because come to think of it, there are so many other countries that are uh, that speak uh, Spanish as their uh, mother right. tongue. And Chinese, if you were to think about it uh, in terms of the number of people. Right. Um, so I'm thinking if people come to if the people go to China to do business with them, eventually, you know, they'll just they become They need another to know, language. yes. The difference with Chinese is that most of the speakers of Chinese are in China. Uh -huh. uh, most of the speakers of English are all around the world. Mm -hmm. And so people learn Chinese, as you say, because they want to do business in mm -hmm. China, not because they want to travel in Europe or whatever. So mm -hmm. Chinese is an important language for those going into China. It's not a language that's really going out to the world to the mm -hmm. same extent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, though, because China is growing as we speak. Right. So as the country grows, I wonder if there's a necessity for other countries' people uh, to learn that language There as well. is. In fact, the Chinese government has established a number of institutes, Confucius institutes. Uh -huh. They have them here in Korea, uh -huh. all around the world, to teach Chinese. Uh -huh. But those are for people who have a special interest in Chinese culture and perhaps who have reasons to, to want to go to China. Uh -huh. It certainly is uh, an important language. Mm. Okay, let's talk about English. Right. Uh, when I started English for the first time, I must have been, what, in my sixth grade or seventh grade. English was a happy language for me. It was all happy. Good morning, good afternoon, uh -huh. good evening. But as I studied more, <laughs> it's, just, it's just over my head. Uh, because you studied linguistics in college, uh, would you say English is comparatively a, an easy language for people to learn? or? It depends where you're coming from, I guess. Um, obviously, it's not that easy for Koreans to learn because it mm -hmm. takes a lot of effort. It's perhaps easier for people coming from uh, uh, languages that have some connection to English, like you know German and, and, and Dutch, for example. Mm -hmm. Somebody coming from a Romance language like French or Italian, not mm -hmm. that easy, any more than I learned French, mm -hmm. for example, and found it very difficult because going from English to a Romance language is very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think all languages are, are equally difficult but in different ways. So mm -hmm. I'm sure if Korean was an easy language to learn, everybody who came to Korea would pick it up very quickly, but they don't. Mm -hmm. So the difficulty is sort of the more you go into a language, the more you find the difficulties are are mm. there. Now let's talk about ESL. Right. Uh, ESL books, you first wrote uh, a book regarding it or about it in 1969. I think ESL so, yes. ESL is English as, as a, second, a language. second language. Yes. We sometimes use the term ESL, English as a second language or English as a foreign language. Um, both sort of synonymous. Mm. I suppose now we talk more about English as an international language mm -hmm. because uh, it's being used in so many different circumstances. Yes, I started um, my first experience in 1969. I wrote simple little books then. Mm -hmm. My publishers, I was teaching in Indonesia actually, mm -hmm. and um, a publisher approached me and said, what sort of books do you think your students need? And I gave him some suggestions. He said, why don't you write one? So uh, I had a chance to write a mm -hmm. book and uh, that took off from there. Oh. What was the most difficult thing when you wrote these books? Because you're a native right. English speaker. That's so right. from to have a third person's point of view who don't know much about yeah. English, how, what, are, what were some of the difficulties? I suppose it's like writing any educational book. You have to try to think of the subject matter from the point of view of the learners. What's going to be difficult for them? Uh -huh. How can you structure it? How can you make it engaging? How can you build in activities and, and topics and things that are going to make it like, uh, learning? Uh, more uh, more fun. I mean, I myself struggled learning French and mm. I've studied Indonesian and so on. And uh, from that experience, I've tried to put into my own books the things I'd like to see in books when I've studied languages. Let's make it interesting. Let's make it fun. My books, uh, you know, they're beautifully illustrated. They're, they're appealing. We mm. try to bring in uh, references to the learner's world. I don't know whether we can show a page from one of my books. You can see um, the sort of thing I'm talking about. If you just, if I just open this at any particular page, for example, there's one there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the idea is to try to connect with the sort of visual world that learners see all around them because these days students 
are surrounded by beautiful images. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, you see beautiful images. You drive around Seoul, you see advertisements on the subway, in magazines. And so they're in a very design-rich environment. Mm -hmm. And so we try to reflect these um, facts in the books to make them uh, more attractive for students, make the learning, it's a painful experience learning mm -hmm. a language. It takes years. Right. And so we try to make it step by step. That's mm -hmm. what I've tried to do in my books. Sometimes I feel discouraged because when I realize that, okay, I cannot master this language uh -huh. called English because I'm not a native. Right. Uh, what, what are some of the hints that you can give us to kind of excel from this to there? This, yes, it's, uh, it's time and practice, really. And those mm. are the things that are often lacking in the Korean context, that there's, the, there's not opportunities to practice. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's not enough time in the curriculum because mm. the students also have a lot of other things they have to learn as part mm. of their... So, so it's, those are the things that are difficult, I think. But sometimes um, when I reflect on, for example, Korean students and I compare them with, say, European students mm -hmm. and why European students do much better than Korean students, I think there are some interesting factors here. I think one thing is there's not a huge need for English in Korea, in a sense. Young Koreans can grow up and they see auntie's got a successful business, she doesn't speak English. Uncle's doing this and that, he mm -hmm. makes a lot of money, he doesn't mm -hmm. speak English, so why do I have to take mm. English very seriously? Mm. Um, and because um, young Koreans, in Europe, young Europeans are surrounded by countries with many different languages and they mm -hmm. get on the bus an hour later in a different country with a different language. You have to know English to be able to communicate. So there's a real need for young Europeans to develop practical skills in English. They all do. Mm -hmm. They leave school, they can survive in English. There's, that, there's not that practical pressure on Korean students mm. to um, really master the language. Then they get to university or, and then they discover they've got to take tests in English and it becomes more of a practical reality. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's difficult for, for Korean students. Mm. It's the motivational factor but also the lack of opportunity to use mm. the language. I see. Okay, before I ask you questions regarding um, interchange, uh, let's take a quick look at this video clip that we put together of this event you attended oh, right. yesterday. Sometimes teachers say, you know, we would... I suppose you give lectures at every school. I do a lot of workshops. These clips are taken from a, a, a tour I did just earlier in the year in Brazil. Um, and um, in these uh, trips, I try to do presentations for teachers. I don't talk about my books. Mm -hmm. Publishers say they'll sell my books. They'd rather I talk to teachers and try to hmm. bring them up to date on current theories and approaches. So in my presentations, I normally uh, meet teachers and uh, we, that's what I've been doing here in Korea on this visit. I've been working with teachers, talking to teachers about teaching. Hmm. And I leave the book selling to my publishers. Hmm. These, uh, ah, this would be the use. talk I gave at the Women's University here on Saturday, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a talk so, about anyway, really what is the nature of expertise in language um, teaching? How do you become a better English teacher? What are the different things that teachers need to know and be able to do to be successful as teachers? That's something that I've had a research interest in. Here's the uh, professional development. I've written books about that. And of course in Korea, teachers are at different stages in their professional right. development. You have uh, expatriate teachers here. Korean teachers all practice, think, working at different levels of expertise, if you like. Be built up, uh, overnight.